The 1920s, a period of glamour, fortune, and a strange obsession with Egypt. Since the late 1700s, starting with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone by Napoleon, the Western world was captivated by the allure of ancient Egyptian culture. The civilization's culture was rich with old gods and powerful pharaohs, and of course, literal riches in gold, silver, and many other ancient treasures. Their architecture was glorious and immense. The fact that anything could have survived those thousands of years was just plain fascinating to the ever-expanding Western society. The land was impossibly old, ancient even to the Romans and Greeks. Enter Howard Carter. A young and ambitious Egyptologist who, inspired by his father, moved to Egypt to further his studies. By 1899, Carter was the appointed inspector for many excavations in Thebes. Carter oversaw various excavations funded by the American archaeologist Theodore Davis. These excavations were done in the Valley of the Kings, the legendary archaeological site, where, to this day, new artifacts and tombs are still being found. It didn't always go smoothly. In 1904, Carter was moved to Lower Egypt following a dispute with locals concerning theft. He soon earned a reputation in the world of Egyptology for his extremely meticulous way of excavating and preserving tombs, as well as accurately cataloging all that laid inside. By 1906, Carter was down on his luck and was no longer supervising anything following the contentious Saqqara affair. He made his money selling paintings to locals until 1907. Most assume his career was over and that he would just become a footnote in history, but soon, everything would change for the Kensington-born Englishman. In 1907, Howard Carter was approached by George Herbert, better known as Lord Carnarvon. Carnarvon was, like many, entranced by the romanticized view of ancient Egypt and was ready to throw money at the best of the best to unearth something new. Carter was quite eager to get back on his feet and advance understanding of the past. Carnarvon was excited to see what Carter could offer in terms of historical knowledge, and also felt if things went well, a lot of money could be gained if something new was discovered. They'd worked together for many years when 1914 rolled around. After a long wait, the expedition had received permission to dig in the Valley of the Kings. It was not fate that made Carter return to the valley. During his early cataloging days, he noticed that almost all of the tombs and mummies were accounted for, except one. That being, King Tutankhamun, and Carter was determined to prove his theory of the boy king's whereabouts. Tutankhamun, or Tut as he soon became known as, was a fairly unremarkable pharaoh, having reigned from 1332 BC to 1323 BC. He died at age 18, having really only reformed parts of the Egyptian religion and moved the capital to Thebes. He was hardly Ramses II. The genuine interest was the tomb itself. All the tombs from the Great Pyramids of Giza to the smallest private burials had long since been picked clean by grave robbers. An undiscovered tomb still containing the many treasures would be a historical event. 1914 wasn't really an excellent year to start due to a little-known event called World War I. The Great War quickly engulfed Europe and thus the eyes of the world. Excavation soon halted, and Carter was forced to work as a diplomatic courier. He so badly wanted to get back to digging, but he grinned and bared it the best he could. The war grinded on until 1918, but by 1917, Carter and Carnarvon were allowed back digging in the valley, eager and ready to find the long-lost tomb of King Tut. After four years of long and arduous digging, Carter and his team found the most baffling thing of all, absolutely nothing. Carter had a gut feeling he was close. Carnarvon was less than confident in his partner's optimism. He had wasted a lot of money, and nothing had been found. Carter begged Carnarvon for one last season of digging. Carnarvon reluctantly agreed to it. November 4th, 1922 started off dull and unmemorable. A 12-year-old water boy working for the expedition named Hussein Abdel Rasul sometime that day found something odd while getting water. He told Carter about it, who quickly began digging. He soon sent a letter to Carnarvon, begging him to get to the Valley of the Kings as soon as he could. He arrived on November 23rd alongside his daughter, Lady Evelyn. By the 26th, the tomb had been fully uncovered. 
but it still wasn't clear if it was THE tomb of King Tut. On that day, Carter alongside Carnarvon, Evelyn, and assistant Arthur Callender made a small hole in the doorway using a chisel Carter had gotten for his 17th birthday. As Carter looked through the doorway, into a tomb not touched for over 3,000 years, Carnarvon asked curiously, Do you see anything? In which Carter famously replied with glee, Yes, wonderful things. He could see gold and valuable items everywhere. Lighting fixtures were soon placed, and further excavation began. The team had discovered the long-lost tomb of King Tut. The hopes of fame and fortune were finally over. It was arguably one of the most significant historical discoveries in the 20th century. They were living history at this point. They found over 5,000 artifacts as well as the boy king himself. King Tut's body still laid there just as it had so long ago, untouched by the ravages of time and the cruelty of robbery. The story of the curse of King Tut began in March of 1923. The wrath of the disturbed started with a canary owned by Carter. One morning, while excavating the tomb, he heard a strange noise. He soon found his pet bird being eaten by a cobra. In Egyptian folklore, cobras represent royalty. Many sarcophagi were adorned with cobras atop the face carved into the sarcophagus. Some writers saw this act as the royalty fighting back from the beyond. The story quickly spread, but Carter paid no mind to it, calling the idea of a curse. Tommy Rock. Soon the writer, Mary Corelli, wrote an article in the New York World claiming that dire consequences will befall any who enter the tomb. At the same time, Carnarvon was quick to capitalize on the expedition's success, selling the exclusive media rights to cover the opening of the tomb to the British newspaper, The Times. This obviously aggravated other newspapers, but their time to shine was coming very, very near. Carter and Carnarvon were in a skirmish on how to handle the Egyptian authorities that oversaw the excavation of the tomb. The partnership between Carter and Carnarvon was coming to a close. The argument was never fully settled. Little did they know it would all end so much sooner than expected. The curse was still in the minds of the superstitious when Carnarvon was bitten by a mosquito on March 19th. Nobody thought much about it. Soon, he cut the wound open by accident while shaving. It got infected, and on April 5th, 1923, he died. The cause of death was blood poisoning, which became pneumonia, all caused by the mosquito bite. Carnarvon had been in poor health for decades following a car accident. It seemed the mosquito had been the last straw for the 56-year-old. Newspapers soon reported on that day that all the power in Cairo suddenly went out. Alongside blackouts, rumor has it that back home in England, Lord Carnarvon's dog let out one final bellow, as he also died on April 5th. Neither of these stories can be absolutely confirmed, although it should be noted power failings in Cairo were common, and the person who reported the dog's death, Lord Porchester, was in India at the time. At first, it was just a bird eaten by a cobra, but now the media was ready to pounce. They saw huge potential in selling the curse story to Western audiences. Newspapers were not allowed to cover the exclusive opening of the tomb, but nobody said they couldn't cover everything surrounding it, including the curse that had seemingly gone from rumor to front-page news after the unfortunate death of Lord Carnarvon. The media was swarming, and it was the introduction of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, who furthered the story of the curse. Doyle, at the time, was obsessed with the occult and latched onto a story of a curse immediately. Without a shadow of a doubt, he attributed Carnarvon's death to cursed elementals who protected the tomb. Doyle was already an extremely influential person, and his word was not taken lightly. One newspaper outlet furthered the interest in the paranormal goings-on and insisted that the entrance of the tomb read, They who enter this tomb shall swiftly be visited by the wings of death. 
Mysteriously, this phrase inscribed has vanished. There is no official word on the entrance having anything like that plastered up the front. Another common phrase in newspapers was text from an Anubis statue in the tomb. The papers claimed it said, I will kill all of those who cross this threshold into the sacred precincts of the royal king who lives forever. In reality, all it said was, I am the one who prevents the sand from blocking the secret chamber. Besides the untimely death and threats of the mummy's curse, the excavation went on, and eventually King Tut himself was inspected, unwrapped and under examination by Dr. Douglas Derry and Dr. Selah Bey Hamdi with Carter in attendance. The group wanted to learn more about the boy king and little more. While conducting the autopsy, something strange was noticed. Tut's face had a lesion on his cheek, strangely resembling the same one that Lord Carnarvon had on his face after the mosquito bite. By this point, Carnarvon was already buried. It wasn't possible to determine if it was the same cheek and if it literally looked the same. Regardless, this discovery to the media pointed even more to something paranormal going on. Carter and his team were granted full rights to dig and excavate without any interference, so that's what he did. Pictures were taken, artifacts were carefully removed and sent home to England. Carter was moving at a rapid speed, and the world continued to be fascinated by the discovery. The more Carter's team dug, the more the death toll seemingly rose. George J. Gould was a powerful financer, son of the infamous robber Baron J. Gould. Gould was allowed to visit the tomb, something wealthy Westerners would do, seeing the site as a symbol of power and not its true historical importance. Gould seemed to contract a fever while on his trip to use Tut to further his own importance. It soon turned into pneumonia, and he died in the French Riviera shortly after leaving the Valley of the Kings. He was 59 at the time. Dying of pneumonia was pretty common at the time, although it is fun to imagine Tut swiftly enacting revenge on a greedy railroad tycoon. By 1925, things were going fairly smoothly with no deaths and no problems, until Carter's friend, Sir Bruce Ingham, was supposedly given a paperweight of a real mummified hand as a gift. Attached to that hand was a scarab bracelet that read, Cursed be he who moves my body. To him shall come fire, water, and pestilence. Ingham's house soon burned to the ground. Luckily, he survived. It was rebuilt, but the hand still remained. A flood quickly struck Ingham's newly rebuilt house, and he lost it again. This all sounds credible, but we couldn't find a single source to corroborate this story. If it happened, it's quite the coincidence, but that's a mighty if. Howard Carter himself still did not give a second thought on the chance of there being a curse. He said, The sentiment of Egyptologists is not one of fear, but of respect and awe, entirely opposed to foolish superstitions. That same year, Carter ironically reported seeing a jackal, the same animal that the Egyptian god Anubis was based upon, for the first time while working in the desert for over 30 years. Deny the gods and they will show themselves, we suppose. Time went on and the curse was less sensationalized as it once was, but Carter was still hard at work, and by 1928, they were only a few years away from finally putting the Valley of the Kings and Tut behind them. Just because interest started to die down didn't mean those who entered were safe by any means. The next supposed victim of King Tut was Arthur Cruttenden Mace, who died in 1928 due to complications with pneumonia. Mace was part of Carter's team from the beginning and suffered from pneumonia for years. He was in a nursing home when he died. Mace's passing seemed to be one of the media's last attempts to capitalize on the curse story they still had been selling. The final death that was attributed to the curse was Richard Bethel, who was Carter's secretary during the discovery and excavation. In 1929, he died in his bed at a Mayfair club seemingly from a heart attack. What was strange is that the man never had any other health conditions. During his autopsy, they found that he died from asphyxiation. The leading theory soon became that he was murdered. But the problem with that is, is nobody at the club heard a break-in, and the lock on the door was still intact, same with the windows. If he was murdered, then the crime was never officially solved. Bethel would be the last death associated with the excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb, for the press had long since moved on to covering events like the Great Depression. By 
1932, it was all over. The tomb was successfully excavated and everything inside was carefully cataloged and accounted for. Howard Carter had made the most magnificent discovery in the modern world. During the excavation, he had been honored by the Egyptian king at the time, toured around the world giving speeches and talking about his discovery. Even President Calvin Coolidge requested a private lecture from Carter in 1924. Carter retired soon after work on the tomb ended. He would spend the rest of his life living in Egypt and England and dealing in art from time to time. Carter lived alone, having made few friends due to his quick temper, something he was keenly aware of. He never showed interest in marriage. In some ways, he had always been married to his work. One can imagine the aging archaeologist sitting in his chair long into the night, continuing to learn about things he never knew, all because he valued knowledge above all. Howard Carter passed away in 1939 from Hodgkin lymphoma. All the years he spent working possibly contributed to his death. He gave his own mortality to unearth something we never thought possible. Although he was no Indiana Jones, he might have actually been better. His unique way of excavating and preserving history while showing it to the modern world has inspired archaeologists to this day. His grave to this day carries this inscription taken from the wishing cup of Tutankhamun. May your spirit live. May you spend millions of years, you who love Thebes, sitting with your face to the north wind, your eyes beholding happiness. The story is finished, and the curse is now just folklore. But we'd quickly like to go over a major theory that historians have about one of Tut's supposed victims. One popular theory of Carnarvon's death specifically was that the tomb had deadly spores that were unleashed when the doors were opened, thus leading to his death. This theory is often used to explain the other deaths as well. This theory is easily disproven. The idea of tomb toxins is quite popular, but there is little proof of it in reality. Other excavations of tombs haven't shown any dangerous toxins, and when Egyptologists wear masks in the tombs is because of dust and sand, nothing more. Such toxins would also kill a lot slower than a couple of weeks in the case of Lord Carnarvon, and a lot quicker than the other people who died over the years. It's an idea that sounds good on paper, but when you look into the statistics, there's nothing. No spores, no toxic air, just an unlucky bite from a mosquito killed Lord Carnarvon. Not a curse from times past, or toxics from a millennia closed room. It may sound fun to talk about curses in King Tut, but as you can see, there is almost no evidence for it. Look at this statistic. Of the 58 people present when the tomb was opened, only 8 died within 12 years. Some of the last survivors of the expedition included Lady Evelyn Carnarvon, who died in 1980 at age 78. She almost lived long enough to see her on-screen depiction in the Brendan Fraser 1999 Mummy movie. The notion of curses in Egypt is a lot more complicated than what the average person thinks. Curses were overall rare to find in tombs. Most that have been discovered come from private tombs from the Old Kingdom era. These curses are less about death and more hilarious specific threats. A man named Ankatifi had this carved into his tomb. Any ruler who shall do evil or wickedness to this coffin, may Hemen not accept any goods he offers, and may his hair not inherit. Not exactly the most threatening curse. There are a few curses from the New Kingdom era that threaten death to robbers, but they are so rare it's barely worth bringing up. The belief in mummy curses as we know it really began in 1827. A writer named John Luden Webb wrote a book called The Mummy that features a curse that brings a mummy back to life to take revenge. She was inspired by an 1821 London striptease show where a mummy was unwrapped. This story beat was soon repeated by other writers like Louisa May Alcott, eventually leading to the 1932 Universal Horror Movie and its many remakes and sequels. At the end of the day, myth, legend, and good old misinformation keeps the idea of the curse of King Tut alive. It's a fun story, and much has been done with it, but it obscures the history and the culture. It makes Egypt look backward and out of step with the world. 
tabloid writers don't care about nations or cultures, it's all about the money. They also don't see how great a discovery this truly was. History in Egypt was forever changed on a November day. It should be celebrated as such. All the people who found the tomb did an excellent service to history. All of them, from Howard Carter to Hussein Abdul Rasul, made the grade with flying colors. The fact a fictional curse dreamed up by hack frauds like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and papers owned by individuals like William Randolph Hearst obscures this achievement is truly sad. King Tut's tomb was found almost a hundred years ago. Howard Carter died 83 years ago. Let the curse die. Let the history live. For history, unlike life, never ends. I suppose most excavators would confess to a feeling of awe, almost embarrassment, when they break into a tomb closed and sealed by pious hands so many centuries ago. We had penetrated two chambers, but when we came to a golden shrine with doors closed and sealed, we realized that we were in the presence of the dead king. We were to witness a spectacle such as no other man in our times had been privileged to see. Laid on that golden outer lid was a tiny wreath of flowers, as it pleased us to think, the last farewell offering of the widowed girl queen to her husband. Among all that regal splendor, everywhere the glint of gold. There was nothing so beautiful as those few withered flowers. They told us what a short period 3,300 years really was. <laughs> 